Bibles, turn with us to the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 47. Ezekiel, chapter number 47. This scripture is a uh, prophetic passage of scripture, and uh, we want to make application today as to what uh, this scripture is all about. And the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 47, I'm going to begin reading with verse number 1, and when I hear pages quieting down, I know you found that. Ezekiel chapter number 47 and verse number 1. Uh, what a blessing it is again to be in the house of God today. We are grateful for this opportunity. Ezekiel chapter number 47 and verse number 1. <clears throat> verse number 1 of Ezekiel chapter number 47. Afterward he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under from the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without unto the other gate by the way that looketh eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits. And he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankle. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through. The waters were to the loins. Afterward, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your good grace. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your blessings, Lord, today, and I thank you for the help that you're going to give us. Father, I stand in need of thee today. God, I stand in need of a cleansing, Lord, of my own sins, my own failures, that I might present the word of God, Lord, to these people that are sitting before us today. God, I feel the humble awesome responsibility, God, that thou hast put upon us. And I pray, God, that you'd help us to rightly divide the word of truth. Father, I pray that you'd stir within us, God, the need, Father, of revival. And God, the need that we have, God, to have our spirit stirred for your glory in these last days that we live in. And Lord, it's a day, God, when we know that life is taken not as, as seriously and, and precious life, God, is not considered as it used to be. And God... On, from the newborn to the, to the adults, God, life has not much meaning. But God, I pray that you'd help us as believers today to understand, God, that we're living in the last days of time, and God, we must be at our best in service for you. For what you'll do for us today, we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this scripture, uh, as many of the scriptures, or most of the scriptures in the book of Ezekiel, it has a prophetic message, and it all has to do and deal with the nation of Israel uh, in future time. But however, we see that Ezekiel is shown here a vision of, of uh, New Jerusalem. And as he's seeing this vision, and the, the one that's showing it to him, all this begins back in chapter number 40. And if you go home today and read chapter 40 through, you'll understand uh, more of this that I'm going to give to you in a nutshell today. But as, as Ezekiel is, is being presented this by the angel and uh, by this man, and as he's being presented this, he, under, he sees water coming out from the building, from the, from the temple. And as he sees water coming out, the angel shows him that water. And uh, it, it has some great meaning to it that we'll show you here in just a moment. I'll tell you something today, friend. I have understood in the last week or two how greatly that we need revival, how greatly that we need a stir among God's people. I've been watching people of God, and I've been looking and seeing and observing how that people act, so-called so Christian, and I see how they act, and I see that we need revival. I understood very much this week that I need revival. I need revival. I need a stirring in my soul because we are living in the last days of time. We don't know how long we've got. I don't know. Uh, Jesus may come before I get through preaching this message. 
And uh, it, you say, well, that's not going to happen. How do you know it's not going to happen? How do you know? Only the Father in heaven knows when he's going to send his son to come back and catch the bride from here. I don't know that I'm, I will get through preaching this message this morning. And we ought to grab into our attention the urgency and the need of having revival stirring our soul. Friend, there's a lot more in life than what, you, than what most people live. There's a lot more about being a Christian than most people will ever enjoy. And that's sad. I enjoy my Christian life. I enjoy being a Christian. I'd rather be saved in God's grace and know I'm going to heaven when I die than anything else that can be in this world. I'm not, you know, I enjoy life because I'm saved by the grace of God. And friend, if we, if we as believers will get out of our heads that we have to be, have fun in this world, and certainly I believe in having fun, but we don't trust in this world to give us our pleasure because it only lasts for a short season. But as believers, we can enjoy the best days of our life, the rest of the days of our life, if we'll get in service for God. And so if you're here this morning and you're not uh, to committed to the Lord and you're not you know, fully committed as a believer to Christ and you're not fully committed to serve Him, then I pray after today that you'll leave here differently than you came in. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you've never been saved by the grace of God, then I pray, my prayer today is for you, is that you be born again and that you get saved today before it's too late. And so we see here, we get back to our text here, Ezekiel is being shown a river uh, that is being described to him here, and that I believe to be the same river in Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and out of the Lamb. This river is a pure river that begins to flow, and uh, as it flows through the desert and it it is, it is so pure that uh, one day in the new kingdom, this very river being spoken of here will flow into the Dead Sea and the Dead Sea will be made alive again. And there again, you can read all of that if I've got your curiosity up and up. Uh, the, the, it says that the fishers will stand near An An Gaddy, and I've been there, and they will stand on the shore near An Gaddy, An Gaddy and they will cast nets into the sea. I've been to the Dead Sea. It's as dead a place as you've ever seen or been around. And, and, though, and uh, that's eventually where this river goes. But now, by application today, I want to read to you what the, again what Ezekiel is seeing and what is, is coming upon him. And verse number 2, Then brought me he me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without unto the utter gate by the way that looketh eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side, and when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cupids, and he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. Now, I'll title my message today, and if you'll listen fast, I'll preach fast. If you'll pray hard, I'll preach hard, and we'll be gone here in about 30, 45 minutes to two hours, whatever God lays on our heart. Don't look so depressed, amen. If God was on me to preach two hours, then you would enjoy it, amen. But thus far in my ministry, he has not been, so that ought to cheer you up a little bit. But in this passage of Scripture, and we read this, the title of our message is, Are You Swimming Yet? Are You Swimming Yet? Well, that's a strange title for a message, but you'll, you'll see when I get through what we're talking about. This, this Scripture, as we make application today, has to do with what, how you are as a Christian. What stage are you living in the Christian life? First of all, let me say this, this river speaks of many things. It speaks of salvation. It speaks of the levels of Christian life. It speaks of healing. Now, how do we know that it speaks of these things? Well, let me say to this, this man was standing on the outside, but when the uh, man began to lead Ezekiel through the water, he led him into the water ankle deep. And I'll say to you today that, salvation begins when you get into the water. Now, people that never get in, people that never are standing on the outside looking in today are people that don't know God. They're people that are lost, that are standing on the shore, and they can see in, and they know that that's where they should be. They know that's where they need to be, yet they don't get into the water. 
have folks come here to the church and admittedly repeat over and over that they need the Lord, but they will not get in the water. I want to tell you something, friend, today. The lost man needs to get into the water to be saved. Amen. He needs to get into the water of salvation. Now, I'm not preaching water baptism for salvation. Don't get me wrong. This is a type. The, the water is a type of the Spirit of God. And for one to be saved, they must have the Spirit of God living on the inside. How do I get that, preacher? How do I get the spirit of the living God living inside of me? Well, you've got to understand that you're lost and that you need the spirit of God living in you. You've got to understand that you must be born again. And, friend, if you understand that today, then you're a good candidate, amen, to get in, amen, to get in the water and have the spirit of God move inside of you. That's what happens when you're lost and you call out to Jesus and you say, Lord, I'm a sinner, will you save me? And he moves into your heart, as several folks have done here in the last couple of weeks. And a burden, a great burden is lifted when you're born again. Now, friend, I'll tell you today that that's the most important thing, that's the most important decision that uh, anyone can make in their life is to accept Christ as their Savior. Without that, you'll die lost without God and you'll go to hell. And I, well, you say, preacher, that's not nice to talk like that. Let me tell you something. I'd be wrong if I didn't warn the unbeliever that except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And if I, listen, do you think people would get saved if, no, if they didn't know that they were lost, if they didn't know that they needed salvation, if they didn't know their destiny, if they didn't get saved, was to go to hell without God? Do you think people would ever get saved? No. You know why people aren't getting saved like they used to in the house of God? Because preachers are afraid to tell them and preachers are afraid to preach the truth for fear that they'll lose their congregation. Friend, I'll preach to you the truth by the help of God. I'll preach to you the truth. And the truth is that you must be born again, that you must be saved. But then comes this, this after you're saved by God's grace, after you know the Lord Jesus, then you need to get in good with the Lord. You need to, how, are you swimming yet? You, you say, preacher, I have no idea what you're talking about. You will. You will. I go to the beach every year. I'm sorry to the Baptist pastor, we go to the coast, all right? But it's still the same thing. I go to the, I go to the beach every year. And do I get in the water? Well, yeah. Now, when I first saw the ocean, I'll never get, forget the day I was up in my teens before I first saw the ocean. And uh, I looked at that, and I thought, man, that's a big pond. they got to be a fish in that. Well, that's what we went for. We went fishing, went deep sea fishing, and guess what? It was a big pond. And I got out there where I couldn't see land anywhere. If I'd have jumped in, I could have only done one thing, sink or swim. Amen? But I, as I got in there the first time, uh, the people we were, you know, it was a, a, my form, one of my former pastors took us deep sea fishing, me and some of the kids. And uh, as, as we got through, he knew I'd never seen the water. He knew I'd never seen the ocean. So he wanted me to get in. So he stopped on the side of the road uh, where there was a beach. And, and uh, you know, we got out. And, and I went down there. And, and uh, I, I had never, I was, I was lost at that point knowing about the water. And I saved spiritually. But I, I looked at that water and I looked around at it. And I thought, man, them waves are big. But I'm going to get in. And so I began, to, I began to walk out there, and I got in about ankle deep, and I thought, that's the other fellow's with me. He was already out there. But I got in there about ankle deep, and I, I thought, man, this is not too bad. I like this. Well, I didn't stay ankle deep too long. But, friend, there's a lot of Christians that get saved by the grace of God. Now, I'm making an application here. You stay with me. There's a lot of Christians that get saved by the grace of God. They get in, but that's where they stay. Now, I know people that go to the ocean, they're just as content to be with, with just wading in the, right there about ankle deep. They don't want to get no farther. They, wade, they can wade ankle deep, and they do that a mile down the shore, and they can see what they can see, and they can see the ocean, and they can reach down, they can pick up the shells, but they're just as happy as they can be being ankle deep in that water. Is there anybody here like that? Yeah, there's a couple. See, nothing wrong with that. Why? Maybe it's the fear of what's out there. Maybe it's the turbulence that they see that's out there that makes them want to, or maybe they just don't like the water that much. It doesn't matter when. There's nothing wrong with that. But for the believer, the child of God, it is not right for, for a spiritual believer 
to stay in ankle deep water. You with me? No, there ought to be a time when you say, well, I don't want to be just, just saved. I don't want to be just out here, but I want to be where out there somewhere. So are you swimming yet? Well, that's the, you know, the, the story here speaks of salvation. It speaks of, of getting it ankle deep as a newborn believer is. Now that little baby that's born back there, these that you saw that were, was this baby, was this baby born? Is that a, this baby was born? As you see that, you notice today, and I don't know what, anything about that, but that little baby, however old it is now, it grows. Now, you look back here at this. And stand up there a minute, Eric. Amen. Stand up there. He, well, he's waiting for me to do that so he can show off. Amen. I don't blame him. But you look at this little baby back here. You look at her. Look how sweet this little baby looks. Look here. Oh, isn't she a darling? Ain't she just the most wonderful thing, sister? Brother, ain't she just the most wonderful thing? Boys, ain't that just the best little sister you've ever had? It's the only one you had, ain't it? But it's the best one, ain't it? Now, let me tell you something. They love you. You can sit down now. He said, I'll stand here all day if you look at my baby. But listen, you, they, they love that little child. But if that, they want that little child, even though they love it as a baby. You know what they want? They want it to grow. Don't y'all want it to grow? They don't want it to remain a baby all of its life. There would be something wrong if that little baby never did grow. I'm glad y'all come this morning. I needed that illustration back. But that little baby, if that little baby never grew, they would get concerned, wouldn't they? They want to know, why is this child not growing? What are we doing wrong? Why is this baby not growing? There would be something wrong. And friend, I'll tell you today, when a child of God gets birthed into the family of God, there should be some growth in that child of God. They shouldn't remain a baby all their life. What causes a baby not to grow? They're not getting fed. They're not getting the right kind of nourishment. Maybe it's because, uh, you know, maybe it's because nobody cares about them. Let me tell you about a newborn child of God. You've got to get the right kind of nourishment. And the right kind of nourishment for the newborn child of God is the Word of God. And so when they begin to partake of the Word of God, they begin to grow. But if you never hear, if you never hear good preaching, I'll just tell you where it's at. If you never hear good Sunday school teachers teaching the Bible, you know I learned a whole lot about, Sunday, about the Lord in Sunday school. I learned a whole lot about Jesus in Sunday school. And today when I, you know, when I hear these Sunday school teachers teach, I usually stay in my study, but I listen in on you sometimes when you're not knowing. You know, you can still learn a lot as an adult in Sunday school. We had almost 50 here this morning, so I'll take this point to plug. Amen. Thank you for coming to Sunday school. And we wish you to be here next week and bring somebody with you. Amen. We want our Sunday school to grow. But listen. When believers, when they begin to learn, they begin to grow. Nobody, and I know people that got saved 10 years ago and they, they know they're saved, but they've never grown in the Lord. They don't do anything. They don't want to see nobody else saved. They don't want anything. They're just glad they're saved. And they don't, you know, nobody's ever told them, listen, you need to grow up. Now, I've been told that a few times, that I needed to grow up. I've been told that a few times as an adult that I needed to grow up. Believe me alone, I'm having a good time in life. Let me tell you something, friend. Newborn believers need to grow. And they grow by the Word of God. They grow by coming to church. They grow by, by being faithful to the house of God. They grow by the preaching of the Word of God. They grow by being fed from the bread that God has in the Word of God. So if, if there's anybody here today that's just ankle deep, I hope it's the desire of your heart that you get in a little deeper in the things of God. Now, let's look at something else here uh, quickly this morning. We see that not only did the angel uh, did the man measure uh, to ankle depth, but again in verse 4, and again he measured 1,000, which is about 1,700 feet uh, thus far. This whole thing, keeping in mind, is about a mile in distance. But he measured out 1,000 uh, and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knee. Now, again, going back to that picture of, of you, on the, you on the seashore, the beach, and you're there and you're nigh ankle deep. Well, that never was good enough for me. I waited there just a little bit, but I wanted to get in a little deeper. So you know what I did? I got out about my knees. I'm really liking this. This is good. So I got out there about my knees. Now, if you picture that, 
and you and you make application here to the one. Listen, when you get in knee deep, you're beginning to get into your prayer life. Knee deep, your knees and your, on your knees in prayer. You begin to. The best thing you can do as a believer, if you're a new convert or if you've been one that's been saved a long time and has never got into the depths of the good things of God where the joy is, amen, where the happiness is, where no matter what goes on, you got Jesus on your side and you know that and it, it, it assures your heart. But you get in knee deep and you begin to get on your knees and you begin to pray. You say, preacher, I, I can't get on my knees. That doesn't matter. It's the it's, it's condition of the position of your heart not the condition of your body. But there's nothing wrong if you have the ability to get on your knees before an almighty God and cry out to Him. And you begin to talk to God, so you get in knee deep. But I'll tell you something, a powerful prayer life will do more for you than anything I can think of because with that, you begin to want to read the Word of God and we'll get there in a minute. But I want to ask you something. How many of you are prayer warriors? How many of you really consider yourself one that prays all that you need to pray? I don't. I lack in that. As your pastor, I'll admit to you that I don't pray as much as I need to pray. God help me, and this has burdened my heart. This has burdened my soul. When I studied this, listen, I've always told you, before the message gets to you, it has to come through me. Amen? And when God gives it to me, I, I, I am burdened with some of the things that I preach to you. And one of the things that I'll preach to you that I'm burdened about this morning is that sometimes I'm not in deep enough when it comes to my prayer life. God help us. Do you remember a time when you prayed more than you used to, than you do now? Do you remember a time when it was more important to you to pray than to do something else? Or has it come a time now where you do something else rather than pray? Now, I'm not against social media. I'm not against, I'm not against the, the, the technology of this world. Y'all know that. We got, we got everything we need here at the church to, to do to spread the gospel even around the world with web page and all the things we're doing with our ministry. And I'm not against that. But I am against it when it comes to taking time away from God that I used to spend with God. Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, help me. And friend, when, those, when the devil will do anything he can to keep you off your knees, he will do anything he can to keep you from being in knee deep in prayer with the things of God. Why? Because when you pray, you have power. And if you don't pray, you don't have power with God. So are you in knee deep? Are you in that deep this morning? Are you just knee deep where you're just now learning to pray? Or do you need to get in deeper? Do you need to get, make sure you're in deep and get in a little deeper? Are you praying today as you should? And then we'll read it on here just a moment. <clears throat> Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the loins. The loins is speaks of your waist. It speaks of the time when you're in and you're, you know, you get up to your loins. After I got out to my knees, I thought, well, I'll get out a little farther. So I got out about waist deep. Now, about waist deep is when uh, those waves begin to pick you up a little bit off the bottom. You know, your feet just touch once in a while. And you get into to, to, uh, your loins, you get into your waist, and that is when you not only are praying, uh, you're in, you know you're in, you want to get in deeper, so you begin to pray. And after you get out there and you love that, you begin to want to learn. You want to know something. And you want to, you want to uh, uh, gain more uh, knowledge of the things of God. So you begin to read your Bible. You begin to let that be an important part of your life. Friend, there is no reason whatsoever that God's people shouldn't read their Bible today. There's no excuse for not reading the Word of God. Oh, me, God help me. God help this preacher. There is no reason that we shouldn't. You say, but I can't carry a Bible with me all the time. How many of you have a cell phone? How many of you have a cell phone? Everybody's raging. Everybody's got a cell phone. You know what's on that cell phone? You know what you can get on that cell phone? It's called an app for the Bible. There's no reason. We'll check, we'll, listen, we'll turn on that cell phone. We'll check for Facebook. We'll check our Instagram. We'll check our email. We can do anything we want to. There's no reason that we shouldn't have the Word of God where we can read it and where we can get it in and where we can feed off of it. That's how you grow, friend, is by praying and is by feeding off the Word of God. Are you in deep? Are you in your waist? Are you in your knees? 
Are you in the audience? I'm preaching something that's very relevant today. Everybody here is somewhere in this message. I don't know where you're at. I don't know where I'm at. And I'll just be the first to tell you, I'm not where I, I'm not where I desire to be. I'm not where I want to be. But where are you at today? In what, in what part of the water are you? Are you in ankle deep? And if you are, do you want to get in deeper? Are you in knee deep? And if you are, are you happy with staying there, or do you want to get in deeper? Or is it up to your waist, and you're beginning to really enjoy the water? Amen. And I enjoy praying. It all goes together. I enjoy the Word of God. But when we get in that deep, we're really... Be now, when I was a kid, I got in the water, and I, I walked out there, and I got about my waist, and I thought, boy, this is getting exciting. Amen. This is getting fun. There are some things I can do out here that I couldn't do while I was in ankle-deep water. There's some things I couldn't do while I was in knee-deep water. I couldn't fight these waves. See, the farther you get along in the Christian experience, the devil's going to fight you harder. It's not going to get easier, my friend. It's going to get, it's going to get harder. But you've got to fight through all that by the help of God. You've got to work through all that that the devil throws at you. But you listen, you learn to get on your knees in prayer when you're in knee-deep water. You learn to read the Word of God. And those things right there is a, is, a, is a good battle plan for fighting the devil. Amen. I can't do it in this old flesh. I've got to have the armor of God. I've got to have his weapons of warfare. So the deeper you get, the harder the devil's going to fight. But I'll tell you something, the greater Christian experience you'll enjoy if you get in. Amen. If you just get in. All right. Final point. I'll be through in about 30 more minutes. Or less. Afterward, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. Are you in waters to swim in? Now, you get up to waters to swim in, and it's up to here, it's up to here, it's over your head. And when you get in there, you're, you're dependent, as a Christian, you're dependent upon the Lord. You're fully surrendered to his will. Now, you get out there in the ocean, you get in over your head. Well, after you get out about that far, usually the waves have calmed down. But there's still a danger of being pulled away. There's still a danger of that undertow pulling you away. I'll tell you something. You get out in waters to swim in. You get out in waters spiritually that you might swim with the Lord. And I'll tell you, you'll have the happiest time of your life when you get in deep water with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Sure, you'll fight the battle. Sure, there's dangers out there. What's out there in that water that's, that looks pretty calm, but there's water, you know, it's swimming water. There's sharks out there. There's jellyfish out there. There's things that you ain't never seen or I ain't never seen out there. And surely as you're out there and something bumps your leg, you're all terrified, but what do you do? You try to get away from that. Listen, friend, we ought to be in the place with God where we're in swimming water. And when we get in swimming water, God can revive us. God can stir us. And when God stirs us, we'll be in swimming water. Are you swimming yet? Are you swimming with the Lord or are you ankle deep? Are you knee deep? Is the water up to your loins? Are you that deep with the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, there's, one, there's a point I missed back there. When it's, high, when, he, when it's up your way, sometimes that's the most miserable place that you can be as a believer. Again, if we make application here, if you're up to your waist, that means you're just half in. Oh, my, you're just half in. I'd rather be anywhere as halfway in. I'd rather be anyway as trying to live with one foot in the world and one foot with the Lord. That's a terrible place to be. How do you know that, preacher? I've been there and done that. That's the most miserable place you can be as a Christian is trying to live with one foot in the world and one foot in the house of God or one foot with the Lord. You got to be in or you got to be out. You got to be in, in fellowship with God's people. You got to be serving the Lord to be happy. You got to be in or you got to be serving the world. I'll just tell you something, my friend, today. I believe I'd rather serve the Lord and be happy than to live in the world or half in the world and, and be unhappy. Are you happy today? You know who the happiest people in the world that I know of are? God's people. 
And you know the happiest of God's people that I know in the world today? Those that are in the will of God, serving God, doing what he wants them to do. The more I serve the Lord, the happier I am. But the less time I spend with him, the more miserable that I become. How is it with you today? Are you in? Are you out? Are you swimming? Are you struggling? Sadly to say, there's many Christians that never get out of knee-deep water. Some will get to their knees. Some will even venture out and get to their waist, but there's few believers that ever get to where they can swim in the, in the good graces of God. Revival will only come. Listen, we need revival. We, we had the revival meeting up, up at Mars Hill uh, this week with the churches, and I heard two great messages preached. I only got to go two nights, but I heard two great messages preached. But I realized we need revival. We need a stir of God. I looked around that congregation a couple of nights when I was there, and you know who the people were there? It was mostly people my age. Now, I ain't telling you how old that is. But I didn't see a lot of young people at that meeting. Did I miss it somewhere, sister? Did I miss it that there was a lot of young people there? A couple of nights, at, but sister, there wasn't a lot of young people. You know why? Because they don't see no excitement in the house of God. Now, there's a couple of things that I'm for. I'm for preaching the Word of God. I believe that it will draw people to the house of God. And I believe that get them to the house of God, I believe that we teach them in Sunday school the things that they want to, you know, the things that they need to learn and the things we want them to learn. Now, you say, what about getting them in here with entertainment? Get them in with entertainment, and somebody else will entertain them better, and they'll take them away. How do you know that? I've been there and done that too. Ask me later, and I'll tell you exactly the experiences I've had with that. Listen, you, the whole, if the Holy Spirit don't draw people to the house of God, friend, it's, it's, of no, it's of no avail. Revival will come when God's people that are here in this church this morning, when the people of God desire more than anything else to be in, 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 in the water with the Lord Jesus Christ, in swimming water, and the Holy Spirit of God controls our lives, and then, friend, that's when revival will come, and there's no telling what God will do with this church. Now, over the past four years, I've seen some great things done here. I am amazed. I am amazed at what this church has accomplished and what has, had, has happened in four years. I'm just, I stand back and look at God and I say, Lord, look what you've done. Now, I've not done this, amen. God has done what's done around here. I take no credit for anything. It's God, but I'll tell you something, my friend. When God in heaven moves around in my soul and when he begins to stir in your spirit and when you decide that more than, more than, more than the ball game, more than the racetrack, more than anything else that I know of, more than any entertainment this world can give me. I want to be with God's people. I want to be in swimming water with the Lord. And friends, you'll be the happiest you've ever been. Now the first thing, you know, I've dealt with all this in my past. The first thing the devil wants to come and say to you is, well, you're going to have to give up a lot of things if you get in with God. You're only going to have to give up one thing that, you won't, that you'll regret giving up. Amen. Not one thing. You say, prove it to me, preacher. Well, I want to tell you something. I enjoy life as much as anybody else in this world. And there's a bunch of things that in this world I don't partake of. I don't drink. I don't, I don't run around and carouse. I don't do drugs. I don't do all those things that people say make them so happy. But I want to tell you something. I want to get in so deep with God that I stay full of Him. Amen. God help us to get to that place. God help me to get to that place. Where are you with the Lord? Everybody stand with, uh, with, with you, please. Every head bowed. No one looking around. Now, I promise you I have did exactly what God wanted me to do today. I love you with all my heart. But I want to see God stir this place. I want to see God move in this church greater than ever before. Is He moving now? Yes, He's moving. Is the Spirit of God working? Yes, the Spirit of God's working. But I'll tell you something, friend. The deeper we get with the Lord, the deeper we want to be. Well, let me ask you something today. While every head's back.